get out and make room for Matt. Thanks, guys. All right, well, good morning to you. It is good to be here today at our Northland campus. I want to welcome you uh, at Thornton and Fort Lupton campus as we gather together around God's Word today uh, with this series called Ask Anything. Uh, that last week we got this party started, uh, really a series uh, answering the questions that you've had on your mind. And over the past several weeks, we've been collecting these questions, and now we have pages upon pages of questions uh, to answer. And uh, it's actually not too late uh, to get into the party. If you want to, you can still participate in this. Uh, the number to send your questions to is this, 720 Two three zero six eight six five. All right, that is seven two zero two three zero six eight six five. You can send uh, your questions to that number, and uh, we collect them all. Then we pray over them and search through them, look at what's the most asked question, and then try to answer them on the weekend. And so you can be a part of that. Last week, kind of funny, at nine thirty, I accidentally gave out my cell phone number for that, and so that was a mistake. So, um, so just to know, that's the number that I just gave you is the. A text number that you can uh, send to. And any question that you have, whether that be about faith, the Bible, theology, church, why Pastor Kim hates Texas, whatever it might be, uh, you can send your questions in and we'll take a look at them and try to answer uh, as many as we can, all right? And so as we get started today, uh, one of the things that we talked about last week is that this whole series is really built around the questions uh, that you've asked. And we're not just simply doing this series to answer questions for answering questions' sake. But as we look at the Gospels, and particularly the teachings of, of Jesus, one of the things that we come across is that Jesus says that we're to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our mind. And what he's revealing in that comment is really kind of the three factors when it comes to our faith lives, that, that our faith has three components. It has an emotional component, that's the heart. It has a spiritual component, that's the soul. And it has an intellectual component, that's the mind. And that this series is really driven towards uh, engaging our minds around the things of God. That the reality is that we all live in a world that is constantly hurling questions at us and at our faith, aren't we? And in fact, probably many of us who have been in the faith, who believe in Jesus, who, who try to live by the word of God, that oftentimes we have questions of our own. And that a lot of those questions that we have are really hard questions. And yet the good news is, is that a lot of those hard questions also have really good answers. And that those good answers lead us to understanding and knowing and seeing God better and loving him more deeply today than we even did yesterday. And so really that is the heartbeat of this whole series is, is not just to answer questions for answering questions sake, but to drive us into deeper relationship with Jesus by answering the questions. And as Peter says in his letter, so that we would all have an answer for the hope that we have in Jesus, all right? So we're gonna answer four questions this week. We did three last week, celebrated baptism. This week, we're gonna answer four questions. And so we're gonna jump right into it today. And so the first question out of the gate is this. In all of the gospels, Jesus speaks in parables and is quoted referencing Isaiah 6, 9, i.e. in Mark 4, 11, and 12. He does this so that they do not reject a clearly understood truth and face greater condemnation. However, without the Holy Spirit to guide them in understanding like we have now, how were they expected to understand the parables without Jesus' explanation? All right, so with this first question, we're going to have a little fun with parables today, all right? And so if you have your Bibles, I want you to go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 4. We're going to look at the scripture that this question uh, speaks to or alludes to in the question. That as soon as I saw this question come in, I knew that I wanted to answer it. And the reason that I wanted to answer it is because as we look at the life of Jesus, so often we see Jesus delivering big spiritual truth in parable form. If you read through the Gospels, what you'll come across and find is that over one-third of Jesus' teachings happen through parables. That oftentimes people would come up to Jesus and they would ask him a question like you're asking me questions. And the way that he would answer them more times than not was through a parable. 
where he would deliver these big spiritual truths on discipleship and money, on grace, on the kingdom of God, so on and so forth, that he would deliver these big spiritual truths through these stories. And so, this is an important question for us. It's not only an important question, but the answer we need. And we need this answer because it helps us, as we understand parables, it helps us in our relationship with Jesus and understanding what it is that he was teaching to us in his life here on earth. And so, if you have your Bibles, Mark chapter 4, we're going to read verses 10, 11, and 12. You can follow along on the screen if you don't have a Bible. Here's what Mark writes to us. He says, and when he, that's Jesus, was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, everything is in parables, so that they may, de- may indeed see, but not perceive, and may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. Now, when it comes to parables, there's a couple of things that we need to understand that helps us answering this question. And the first thing that we need to understand is what a parable actually is. That a parable is simply a story or a tool that Jesus used to deliver a spiritual concept more concretely for us. That it's a tool that Jesus has used to take these spiritual truths that are big and large and sometimes like way out there and bring it to a level in which we can can understand. That's what a, a, uh, a parable all is. One of the easiest parables maybe to understand and to see is in Matthew chapter 13. So we'll use this in this example. That one day Jesus is walking about and he's doing this teaching on the kingdom of God. And he says this, that the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. That the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of God, that's the spiritual reality. That's the big spiritual truth. And then he brings it more uh, concretely to us. And he says it's like a small little mustard seed. And what Jesus was revealing in this parable is that the mystery of the kingdom is that the kingdom came in Jesus, in just a small seed, in one man. But one day, that seed is going to grow into a strong and vibrant tree for everyone to see. Not only is this a parable, but it's also a prophecy that we've seen lived out throughout the history of the world. That that this, this kingdom of God started with one man in Jesus, and it's bloomed through the church into this vibrant tree that we're a part of some 2,000 years later, where hundreds of millions, not if not billions of people, are part of the kingdom of God through the church, that's what a parable is. It's a tool that Jesus used to help a grand spiritual truth be brought to a more physical and concrete place for us in order that we might understand. The second thing that we need to know, and this helps address the question that's being asked here, is why did Jesus speak in parables? Why, when someone came and asked Jesus a question, did he respond with a story or with an analogy in parable form? Well, there's two main reasons for a parable. The first reason is so that people who were seeking would know the truth. And the second reason is to hide truth from other people. Another way to say it is this, is that people who were seeking God, who, whose hearts were turning towards God and they wanted to, to know God more, that parables offered a way for them to understand the truth of God more clearly. But for those who opposed Jesus, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the people who thought Jesus was silly, that when they heard parables, they thought it was foolish. And those parables would actually bring greater condemnation on those people. So when it comes to the Holy Spirit... And the role that the Holy Spirit plays within the interpretation of Scripture and particularly in our understanding of parables, that in this question, the question assumes that the Holy Spirit was not at work before Pentecost. And if you remember, Pentecost is that event where the Holy Spirit moves from like a river flowing within the banks to an all-out flood in our lives. That's a parable for you, all right? That at the day of Pentecost, everything changes with the Holy Spirit. But before Pentecost, it wasn't like the work of the Holy Spirit wasn't going on. In fact, we see the work of the Holy Spirit happening in and through people who were seeking God throughout the history of the Scriptures. That one of those places is in Nehemiah. So in your Old Testament is a little prophetic book called Nehemiah. And in it, the prophet um, Ezra says these words. And these are important words to help us understand how the Holy Spirit has worked throughout the history of the world. Uh, The the prophet Ezra says these, you, he's speaking of God, gave your good spirit to instruct them, that's the people of Israel wandering through the desert, 
and did not withhold your manna from their mouths and gave them water for their thirst. That this verse, among many other in the Old and New Testament, we see and know that the Spirit is at work in people's lives before they believe. That if you're a believer here, if you're a follower of Jesus, before you were a follower of Jesus, the Spirit of God was at work in your life. And his role before you were a believer was to help you see God and to understand the things of God, to instruct you, just like what's happening here in the book of Nehemiah. And then once you become a believer, it's like the Holy Spirit goes from this river within the banks to an all-out flood in your life. And not only do you get understanding, but you know the presence of God. And God gives these good gifts to you to, to encourage other believers and other Christians and other people in your life. And not only that, but you're filled with love and your fears start to, to like dissipate and flourishing comes in your life. That all of that comes with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That before you were a believer, the Spirit was out here helping you understand and see God. But once you believe, the Spirit enters into you, God with you, and all of these promises then become real, reality in your life. So when it comes to parables, we see that the Spirit was indeed at work in people's lives, even before they believed, that people who are pursuing God, the Spirit is at work helping them understand the one main point of the story that Jesus was communicating in order for them to see God more clearly. And consequently, those who thought Jesus was a joke, those people who thought Jesus uh, was, was foolish, the Spirit was silent in their lives, and condemnation came over them. Now, there's a lot more to say about parables, but that answers the question. And just to kind of give you a preview, this fall, we're going to go through the book of Luke. And there are going to be many, many parables that we see Jesus speak to people. And when we come up against those parables, we are going to take some time to help us understand what a parable is, how we interpret a parable, and how the Spirit of God works in concert with that in the lives of a believer, all right? So you can look forward to that this fall. That's question number one. Ready for question number two? It's a doozy. All right, Calvinism versus Arminianism. What's the deal, and does Crossroads take a stance? Now, this is the second most asked question of this series so far. And it's a little surprising to me because this question is deeply theological, and you actually have to have kind of a background in theology to even know what you're asking when you ask a question like this, all right? This week I was sharing with the pastors uh, that I was going to take on this question, and immediately they started taking bets that I couldn't get this done in 10 minutes. Challenge accepted, all right? Start your watches. Here we go. When we talk about Calvinism and Arminianism, what we're talking about is something called systematic theology. Systematic theology takes the 30,000-foot view, looks at Scripture, and tries to take Scripture and put it into theological concepts that help us understand Scripture, the Bible, when we read it. Another way to think of systematic theology, it's like a pair of glasses or lenses that we put on that help us understand what we're reading. We're, we're reading it through a lens. That's what systematic theology is. Now for a little history. John Calvin was a French theologian who lived during the 1500s. And he wrote ex, uh, extensively about salvation and how our salvation worked specifically in concert with the sovereignty of God. Calvin had a huge following in his day. His following is even as big today. And those people who subscribed to his systematic theology became known as Calvinists. That's how all of this got started. Now, oftentimes when we talk about Calvinism, we talk about the five points of Calvinism. And I'll get to those in a minute. But the ironic thing is, is that Calvin didn't actually come up with the five points of Calvinism. A guy named Jacobus Arminius came up with the five points. Jacob Arminius was actually a Dutch theologian who lived during the 1600s, about 100 years after John Calvin. And one day he was in a fierce debate with a Calvinist, and in the midst of that debate he said, these are the five things that I disagree with you about. And out of those five things came the five points of Calvinism. Now, Arminius uh, had a following in his day, and those who subscribed to his systematic theology became known as Arminianism. That's what it became known. That's the movement. And in recent years, relatively recent history, uh, he's become quite popular. And if you're traveling in theological circles, undoubtedly you will be placed in one of those two camps. Either you will be a Calvinist 
or you'll be an Arminius. That's one of the two camps that you'll be placed in. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you the five points of Calvinism, the doctrines that they're attached to. I'm going to give you a sentence of how each one views it, and then I'll wrap it up at the bottom, all right? So the first point of Calvinism um, surrounds or is a, surrounds around or comes around the doctrine of what we call depravity, the doctrine of depravity. That Calvin teaches that every single one of us are depraved and rebellious towards God and that we have no ability, this is important, that we have no ability to trust God on our own without God's special assistance of grace in our lives that when we accept his grace, we believe and we are saved. Arminianism teaches that people are deprived and that they are rebellious towards God, but that people actually have the ability to trust God with some general help that God gives to all people. That's point number one. Point number two of Calvinism revolves around the doctrine of election. Now, this is the fighting one, all right? This is where people get in fights. That Calvin taught that we are chosen by God, that we are elected by God. That God chooses mercifully those he will save and justly those who he will leave in their rebellion. Arminius taught that God has chosen all of us, that he has elected all of us, that, that he used his foresight to see who would believe, and then he chose all of us in that. In other words, think of it this way, that before the beginning of time, that God looked into the future through his foreknowledge, and he saw who was going to be saved. So, so John Sober, he saw that John was going to choose him in his life. And so before time even began, God elected John to be one of the saved. The third point is the doctrine of atonement. The Calvinists believe that the death of Jesus provided sufficient atonement for all. But in its design, it's only effective for the elect, for those who have been chosen. Arminius believe that the death of Jesus provides sufficient atonement for all. And by design, that atonement would be effective for the virtue of faith so that you could choose whether or not you believed and obtained forgiveness from God. The fourth point revolves around the doctrine of grace. For the Calvinists, he would say that grace is irresistible. That once you see and experience God's grace, you can't help but take a step in God's direction. And as you do, God does and moves within your heart and renews your spirit and you're saved. Arminian taught that grace can be resisted. That when you see God's grace, you can choose to accept it or not. But if you accept it, then God starts the work in your heart of changing your soul and thus you becoming saved. The fifth point of Calvinism revolves around the doctrine that we call perseverance. That a Calvinist would say that once you are saved, you are always saved. That God is continually at work in your life, preserving your faith. That nothing can separate you from the love of God. The Arminian says that God is at work preserving your faith, but he does not prevent you from turning from the faith. That you can lose your faith. So those are the five points of Calvinism, it, it begins with depravity, then election, then atonement, grace, and perseverance. Now, oftentimes, when we talk about Calvinism versus Arminianism, we oftentimes move to thinking that the grand point of all of it, or the thing that really uh, separates Calvinism from Arminianism, is the sovereignty of God, kind of. Both of them believe in the sovereignty of God. They just have a little different take on how that works. The real key difference between Arminianism, Arminianism and Calvinism is how you view your salvation. The Calvinist would say that God has produced everything in your life so that you have the desire, the desire for a decision to follow Jesus. The Arminian says that you have produced everything in your life for the desire to choose God, and God helps you in that. So where does Crossroads stand on the issue? We stand with our friends. That if you were to take a scale with Calvinism on one side and Arminianism on the other side, we have pastors on this staff who are Calvinists. We have a few like fence setters in the middle. And then we have some who are Arminians. And then we have Pastor Brad. All right? 
At the end of the day, we can have conversation of this, we can have good-natured arguments over this, but it's not something that divides us. This is an open-handed issue for us. This is systematic theology, not biblical theology. At the end of the day, when we look at salvation, we just lean on Paul, where Paul said in Ephesians that your salvation is by faith, through grace alone, not by your works, so that no one can boast. You got it? All right, that was nine minutes. Pastor Chris, that's number one from Chick-fil-A, no pickles and a Coke on Monday. All right. <laughs> question number three, question number three. What does it look like to honor parents as adults, especially a dysfunctional one? This is a good question. This question arises from the Ten Commandments. But if you know your biblical history, then you know that after God saved Israel from the oppression of Egypt and of Pharaoh, that Moses is their leader, and he's leading them through the desert, and they end up at a place called Mount Sinai. And Moses goes up the mountain, and he speaks with God, and God says, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to establish my covenant with my people. In other words, this is what it looks like to live for God. And Moses comes down with these things that we call the Ten Commandments or the Ten Words, and he reads them over the people, and commandment number five says, honor your father and your mother. We later see this repeated in the New Testament, specifically in Ephesians chapter 5, where again, it says, honor your father and your mother. That of the 10 words, these 10 summaries of what it looks like to live for God, this is the only one that has a promise attached to it. That we are to honor our father and mother, and the promise given to us is that our days would be long. So whoever wrote this question in, I want you to know that you're not alone in this struggle. That this last Wednesday, I was at a dinner gathering with a whole bunch of people, and we were sitting around a table eating dinner together, and the conversation moved to this series of Ask Anything, and, and we were having some fun with the questions, and, and then I started to kind of reveal what were some of the questions that I was going to answer this week. And when I got to this question, about half the people, half the adults sitting around the table identified with this as a struggle in their lives. This is a big issue. How do we honor our parents, particularly as adults, especially when our parents are dysfunctional? The reality is, is that, that all of us come from some sort of dysfunction in our families, ranging from outright abuse to enmeshment to disregard for God and his word and everything in between and around that. And oftentimes, the dysfunction of our family causes guilt and shame and fear and anger and bitterness in our lives as we try to navigate through that. And as adults, we, we want to do right by God. As followers of Jesus, we, we want to follow his teachings. We want to live for him. And we get to this place, honor your father and your mother. And we look back on the dysfunction of our lives and we go, how does that work? What does that look like? How do I live in that as a follower of Jesus? This is a good question. As we answer this question, what I do, want to do is I want to first answer the question what honor is not. And then I want to take you what honor is. The honor, the first thing that we need to see is that honor is not obeying your parents at all costs. That somewhere in Christian history, we have made synonymous the word honor with obedience at all costs. And yet it's simply not true. That while obedience has a place in honor and helps us honor, help us bring honor upon people, obedience at all costs is not what we're called to when we're honoring people. That as adults, we have responsibility and we must accept that responsibility for the decisions and the behaviors that we make. That as adults, we are not to allow our parents to, to lead us into unwise decisions. That as adults, we're, we're not to allow our parents to leave us into places of evil or even to places where, where, where that is ungodly. That those behaviors, those decisions are ours and ours alone and that we have to be responsible for those. The second thing that we have to see when it comes to what honor is not is that honor is not changing the outcomes of the past. Nor is it fixing the flaws of our parents in the present or changing the decisions that they're going to make in the future. That's not what honor is. And the reality is, is that you can't change any of that anyways, can you? We can't do that. 
And so if that's what honor is not, then biblically speaking, what is honor? And how do we demonstrate it to our parents as adults? Well, from Scripture, I think honor is three things. The first thing is this, is that, that honor is choosing respect. It's choosing respect. That that is the very simplest definition that I can give you when it comes to honor. That honor is choosing to respect someone. That you treat that person as important, no matter what you think of them. See, when we open up the beginning pages of Scripture and we read through the very first chapter of Genesis, one of the things that we find out pretty early is that every single one of us is created in the image of God. That every single one of us are image bearers of God. That we all have an importance because we bear the image of God and that we should be treated and treat others that way. See, you can always say a kind word about or to a person. That's within your control. You can always do that. Even if someone's disrespecting you or you're in an argument and you disagree, you can always take the high road of respect. And when you don't have something nice to say to someone, you can just do what you've taught your kids. Say nothing at all. That every single one of us has the ability to choose respect. And honor is choosing respect with the people that God puts in our lives always. The second thing about honor is a willingness to forgive. That in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 31, Paul writes these words. These are some of my life verses. It says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. And all malice, do away with that. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving them as God in Christ has forgiven you. That is a powerful verse on, on so many levels, but specific to this question. Last month, we did a series called Chronic. And on Father's Day, Pastor Chris gave a great message on anger. And the result of anger and bitterness when it takes root in our lives. And the thing is, when we're dealing with dysfunctional family and specifically dysfunctional parents, and we look back on the pain that's been caused and the fear and the guilt that we live with, and the uncertainty that's that's been caused in our life, it is very easy for us to go down the route of anger and malice and slander in our lives. And what Paul teaches us time and time again is that the antidote to anger and bitterness always in your life is forgiveness. Getting to the point where you say, you don't owe me anymore. If you're struggling with anger and bitterness in your life, particularly when it comes to your parents, my encouragement to you is to go back into our archives Watch that chronic sermon through the lens of your parents and, see, and do the hard work of your soul in that way. The third thing that I want to point you to that honor is, is that honor, in honor, we show love. And I know immediately for some of you, <laughs> Matt, you're asking me to respect, forgive, and love the person that's caused pain in my life. Not me, the Bible. That oftentimes, when I'm not sure what to do in a circumstance, I simply ask the question, in this circumstance, in this moment, what does love require of me? What does love require of me? And typically, when I ask that question, intuitively, I know what I need to do. That sometimes when I ask that question of people in my life, it means that I need to start praying for them, even if they're acting like my enemy. Other times it means that I need to dive in and I need to serve them. Other times it means I need to step back and I need to give them space. But simply slowing down and asking the question, what does love require of me? In this moment, in this circumstance, will reveal a whole breadth of options for the way that you move forward. The Doug Schmidt here at our North Bend campus is a great writer. For part of his career, he was an editor. And uh, a few years ago, he wrote an article on this very subject. And I just want to read an excerpt out of it for you. He says, so to honor a parent has little to do with how that person uses their power and influence of his or her position. But rather, it is simply acknowledging that God has placed that person there. And of course, will one day hold that individual accountable for what he or she did in that role. To honor mom or dad, then, we can say something like this. This is the unique person whom God, in all of his sovereignty, chose to be my mom and or to be my dad. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And then, if necessary, come to terms with, that is, fully grieve the losses the parents' words and behaviors may have caused in your life. Give it all to God. If we do this, he says, I'm convinced 
that the promises of the sixth commandment will gradually make itself evident in our lives and we will know what it looks like to have that promise that comes with it fulfilled in our lives. Those are good words. I hope they help. The fourth question is this. This person writes, I love Jesus and I believe in God's hand on my life, even in hard times. Having recently suffered a miscarriage, what is the biblical and theological view on the death of babies and children? I'm so grateful for this question, for this reason, that I believe that those who have suffered miscarriages and who have lost little ones, those parents are the silent sufferers of the church. That for whatever reason in our society, when, when a little one passes away, our society treats it as not like a big deal, that we're just to move on in life and go on with whatever we have going on. That very rarely do we ever get a call here at the church to help individuals or parents through a miscarriage. Very rarely do we get that call. Very rarely do we ever do a funeral for a stillborn. That for whatever reason, our society, when a little one passes, just says we just move on and continue on with life. And very rarely do we ever allow ourselves to grieve And as we move on in life, there is a flood of questions and fears that come alongside us in that grief because we realize that that child was life and life is not easily forgotten. What about them? And this question comes from the reality that every single one of us are born into sin, that all of us are deprived, that from the moment that we're conceived, we are sinful. And as believers, we we know that that we need Jesus to cover our sins, that that we need Jesus' death and his resurrection. We need to place our faith in him in order for for him to, to cover our sins. So what do we do with the children who never had that opportunity? What about the miscarried baby? What about the stillborn? What about the little one who who dies young, who never had the opportunity to trust Jesus? What about them? This question is really pointing to whether or not God in his mercy has a way to cover their sin even before they have the opportunity to believe. I think the Bible answers this question. And so I want you to turn to Romans chapter 1 if you have your Bible. In the New Testament, you have the Gospels, then Acts, and then Romans. Romans chapter 1 is the great sin passage in all of Scripture. That Paul does a beautiful job of describing what sin is. He points us to what God believes about sin and the way that God responds to sin in it. And in verse 19 of chapter 1, he writes these words. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world. In the things that have been made, so that they are without excuse. The word so there in verse 20 in the Greek is the word therefore. And what Paul is saying is therefore, based on all of this, 19 and 20, they have no excuse. So what's the they there? The they they are the people who have clearly seen and been able to process creation. That those are the people who have no excuse. That for people who can see and process creation, then Paul says that we, those people, should be able to see the divine attributes to God that ultimately lead us to a place of salvation. And if we miss it, there is no excuse on the day of judgment. The implication then is this, that people would seem to have an excuse if they had not seen clearly in nature what God is like. And I don't believe that miscarried babies, little babies, little ones, can process by looking at nature what God is like. They cannot see the holiness of God. They cannot see his justice, his mercy, his grace in creation. They do not have the capability to process that in their minds. And so based on Romans chapter 1, it seems to me that babies would fall into the category of having an excuse. And so what I believe is that God ordains on the day of judgment for all children who died in the womb, 
who died upon delivery, who died as, as little ones, that those who do not have the mental capability to see God in the created order will be, will be covered by the blood of Jesus, not because they're innocent, but because God is merciful. And God will not condemn them because he wants to manifest openly and publicly to everyone that he does not condemn those who do not have the capacity to put their faith in him. And so for whoever answered or asked this question, I want you to have hope on this day that your loss is not an eternal loss. That because of your faith in Jesus, that one day you will be in heaven and that you will enjoy all the fruits of eternity and that one of those fruits of eternity is that you will stand alongside the child that you lost as you worship Jesus forever. Our God is a good, good father. He is merciful. He is loving. Let's never forget that. Let's pray. Father, you are so good to us. And Lord, as we close up our time here, Lord, I just want to say a prayer for all of those, Lord, in this church and who are connected to this church, who have lost a little one. God, there are a few things harder in this world than saying goodbye to a child. And so, Lord, I pray that on this day that you would give them comfort and that you would give them hope, that through your mercy and your grace, Lord, that they could see you so clearly and see the love that you have for them. God, come alongside them. Lord, for those who are struggling with parents in their life who are dysfunctional and they struggle through what it means to honor them just day to day. God, I pray for them. I pray that they would have the courage to show respect as hard as that is sometimes. That they would forgive. That doesn't come easily. And that ultimately, Lord, that they would operate in the love that you show us that that the love that you've given us would overflow in their lives to the people who are causing chaos and havoc in their lives. For those of us who enjoy the Calvinist versus Arminius discussion, Lord, I pray that that wouldn't divide us, but Lord, that that would lead us to good discussion to discover and to know you more. And Lord, I pray that as we dive into parables, Lord, that we would not be confused by what we see, but Lord, that your spirit would help us understand Help us see the truth and the reality that of the spiritual world flooding into this world in such a way that it changes our lives. Finally, God, I pray, Lord, for the people that Paul spoke about in Romans. Lord, who have seen this creation, who have the ability to process, and who have not yet called upon your name to be saved. Lord, would you work especially in their hearts today? For those who are seeking you, would you open their eyes to the realities of who you are and the way that you love them. May today be the day that they put their faith in you. Lord, we pray this in your good name, in the name of Jesus. And all of God's people said, amen.